So good evening, everyone. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? We do have a, they did leave a microphone up here if, if we needed it, but I think between the three of us, our voices are loud enough that you can probably hear us in the back, okay, hopefully? All right, fantastic. So thank you all for coming this evening. Before we get started, I just wanted to note a few folks in the audience. Um, first, Sletman Eric Wellman is here. Uh, Sletman Michael Payne is here. And a big shout out to Sletman uh, Cheryl Cook, who first called me about uh, seeing if I could arrange something um, with the DEP to come out and talk to the residents about uh, coyotes uh, in general, uh, because they seem to be a lot more prevalent in the Farmington Valley. And also, I want a, a, another shout out to somebody who has become, um, well, I guess we're, we're soulmates in that uh, we both had our dogs interact with coyotes, uh, Melissa Osborne. Uh, her dog was attacked. You might have seen that in the paper, and her dog, Boone, had his uh, tail amputated, and unfortunately, my dog wasn't as lucky. Uh, and he was uh, taken from my front yard and, and killed in the woods uh, close by. So uh, we were chatting, and we all felt it was important to uh, talk about uh, the coyote population in general, the do's and don'ts, their habits, and make tonight an educational forum uh, so we can spread the word. So. What happened to us doesn't happen uh, to you all. So tonight uh, with us are, are two experts, I'll say, in uh, the animal world. Uh, the first one is uh, your very own local animal control officer, uh, Mark Rudowitz. Uh, Mark was a uh, U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He was retired from the Hartford Lieutenant, as a Hartford Lieutenant um, in the police department, served training uh, police canine units. Uh, Mark handles all of the animal control calls in the town of Simsbury and has uh, a lot of interaction with coyotes. Uh, seated next to Mark is uh, Chris Vam. Chris is a, a graduate of the University of Connecticut uh, in the Renewable Natural Resources. He's been with Connecticut DEEP, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, since 1989. He's currently serving in the Wildlife Division, uh, manages the Technical Assistance Program, uh, also does beaver damage control, importation and possession permitting and providing technical assistance, nuisance wildlife control to uh, the public. His hobbies include hiking, fishing, hunting, and cycling. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the experts, Chris and Mark, and we will have an opportunity for question and answers at the conclusion of their presentation. We made sure we left plenty of time to have the questions that you want answered answered tonight. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Again, my name is Chris Van, Connecticut Wildlife Division, Hartford office. Uh, I administer the uh, Nuisance Wildlife Control Operator Program. It's part of our technical assistance section of the DEP Wildlife Division. So my responsibilities are primarily to assist the public in responding to nuisance wildlife conflicts. So it is my job to try to provide solutions and assistance to the public to solve their wildlife conflicts. Everything from squirrels in their attic, bats, um, mice, and you know, even though we're not pest control, we help people with small animals, mice, snakes. And um, I do not, you know, obviously we handle most of the coyote complaints. I do not handle bears. I am not a, a bear, a fur bear. I'm not in the fur bear program, so I am not directly involved with, fur, with our bear program. I don't handle deer damage. I don't get that much involved with Canada goose damage, but I do have some assistance there. Um, <clears throat> I want to I want to say something um, funny or to get the, the, the program started tonight. Um, I guess I guess I just want to say that you know the coyote conflicts that we're dealing with in Connecticut have been around for a few decades now, um, for close to 20 to 25 years. Um, I can say that the conflicts with coyotes um, will not necessarily go away. They're, you know, in, my, in some of my opinion, they're going to continue. And in some cases, they may get worse in certain areas. Um, coyotes are certainly a formidable animal, and they can cause some severe damage. And I and I sympathize and I empathize um, with anybody who's lost a beloved pet um, 
by being caught off guard, coyotes in their yard attacking their pets. It's certainly a significant issue. Um, public safety issue is involved as well. Um, I think Connecticut is learning. Many residents um, perhaps are taking um, greater, becoming great, more, more aware of the coyote threats and, and precautions are being taken. And I think, I think things, um, you know, are going to stabilize, but there may be hot spots and ongoing conflicts with coyotes, perhaps like what happened in, what's happening in Simsbury or what happened this past summer. So Mark and I are going to try to tag team this PowerPoint. Um, there's going to be some town specific stuff and I'll ask him to interject and uh, all right let's try to do this eastern coyotes are are certainly um, beautiful animals um, they've been here since the 50s oh why are we going forward oh I hit this <clears throat> They're not native to the Northeast, the New England. They're, they're native to the Midwest. You know, they evolved, adapted to the Great Plains. They, uh, they, they were, you know, in the, the, the tall grass prairies. They hunted rabbits. They were, uh, you know, uh, um, they were a second, second predator on the tier. They're a mid-sized predator. They're not an apex predator. They're not preying on very large prey generally. They're a, they're a mid-level mid predator. They were secondary predators to the, to the, uh, to the um, prairie wolves. And, and uh, you know, they, their populations um, after the ex, ex you know, ex, uh, <laughs> extermination of wolves throughout most of the prairie states, their populations expanded even though um, coyotes were subjected to tremendous um, predator control efforts during that same period from the 18, late 1800s or early 1800s all the way through the early 1900s. You know, large scale government funded predator control um, poisoning all throughout their range to eliminate coyotes um, from depredating livestock. Livestock was a major industry back then and, and uh, so major campaigns were to in, 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 in place to eradicate wolves and coyotes back then. They arrived in Connecticut in the 50s after populations began to migrate out of the Great Plains, migrating into Canada around the Great Lakes and below, below the Great Lakes and, and several different pathways. It's been chronicled and documented. They arrived in Connecticut in the 50s. Some, some of the coyotes that arrived have a small percentage of wolf DNA in their in their makeup. Um, there was some documented hybridization with wolves in the Great Lakes states. Um, wolves were very, you know, on, their, on the periphery of their range, wolves can and, and still do occasionally breed with coyotes in that area. So some coyotes have residual, the best I can explain it, residual DNA um, from wolf interbreeding from the Great Lakes states. That was, that was decades and decades and decades ago. Um, the coyotes that have arrived here are not breeding with wolves. They don't show a coyote-wolf hybrid, something between a wolf and a coyote. The coyotes here are coyotes. Their, their behavior, their fundamental um, um, you know, social behavior, the biological behavior, is 98.99% coyote. They're not a wolf. They're not a, technically, I don't call them coy wolves. They are slightly bigger than the Western coyote. We have coyotes that reach 42, 45 pounds. Uh, we have females that are 35 to 40 pounds. So they are larger. They have the capacity um, to hunt larger prey, just like Western coyotes do. Western coyotes ho hunt pronghorns. They hunt mule deer, mostly hunting fawns. Out here, we have coyotes hunting white-tailed deer. They, they can prey on large game, but they're primarily a mid-sized predator, hunting smaller prey. Um, Mark, 
I believe Mark says he might have took this picture or got it from a resident in Powder Forest. Powder Forest, yeah. You know, golden, I call them um, blonde coyotes. They are many color phases. We've had all black coyotes. We've had the typical salt and pepper gray with, you know, reddish brown highlight coyotes. Um, you know, adult probably male coyote that might weigh 35 to 40 pounds. Most people look at that animal and say, that's 80 to 90 pound coyotes, bigger than any of my German shepherds, and he's gigantic, and he's gotta be a wolf. And I understand that, but you know, an Eastern coyote, you know, can stand pretty high at the shoulders, but they're narrow as boards, and there's not a lot of mass, and they look a lot bigger. So what, so what happened since the, uh, the 50s when coyotes, the late 50s when coyotes showed up? I, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I never saw a coyote in my town of East Hartford. Um, probably many people never saw coyotes until maybe um, the 80s and 90s, maybe. Um, in, the, in the 90s, we started getting more and more complaints. You know, the early 90s was mostly raccoon rabies. The mid 90s was, you know, rabies was kind of losing its, its uh, prominence, but raccoon rabies was still a big deal in the, throughout the 90s, and we dealt with tons of rabid raccoon calls. But coyotes, more and more and more coyote complaints, and people saying, I've lived here 50 years, never ever saw a coyote. Coyotes are now here. They're in my neighborhood. They're in, you know, they're in my community on, on, uh, on, uh, you know, Mayberry Village in East Hartford. They're in, they're in my street now. They're in my community in West Hartford near, near, uh, near my local neighborhood school. They're laying on the school playgrounds. And so during this period, you know, coyotes have already been here since the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, coyotes were expanding into these more heavily developed areas. So coyotes were becoming a greater and greater presence in more and more developed areas. We started getting more and more complaints, obviously, along with coyotes coming in closer and closer proximity to developed communities. We had coyotes causing more and more conflicts, attacking pets. Uh, my pet was attacked. Uh, my cats are gone way back. Cats were a big call. Got a lot of calls on cats. Today, nobody calls us about cats. A lot of them are gone. Um, people lose two or three cats, and, you know, no more. Uh, cats want to be out. They're, um, dog attacks. At the beginning, it was a, it's, and it still, still is true today, I let my dog out at 10 o'clock at night to do his duty, heard a scream, ran out there. There was a wolf or a creature running away. My dog was lying there, and it was either half alive. I brought it to the vet. They put it down um, time and time and time again. And, and the number of coyote attacks on pets increased and increased and increased until, you know, the next 15, 20 years later where you know, the numbers may have kind of leveled out. We're seeing about 40 attacks a year, 25 to 35 to 40 attacks a year. And we think that's probably only about 20, 20, 25% of the actual attacks out there. As you probably realize, reporting it to the deep can be difficult and, you know, it can be confusing. You may never get a hold of us. None of our staff that work in Hartford may never document it. And, there's a lot of attacks going on out there to pets that we don't know about. I can say, you know, you know, with some with some concern that we never got sent the senator's call. Um, I don't think we ever got the call about Boone. Um, we never got the call that Boone was attacked. I don't think. Um, we try to document all the complaints. Coyotes will attack larger dogs, and. It was something we had to learn, I had to learn. It's like, wow, you know, why is a coyote fighting with a 70 pound, 80 pound lab? It's territorial, you know, they set up a, a core area. That dog is just like another coyote, it's just an enemy. And they will target a larger dog. 
And yes, some of the guidelines say don't let your small dogs out at night. But we've had Dobermans and, and, and Great Danes attacked and injured by coyotes. So they are not necessarily afraid of your big dog. Um, and we've had, we've had people attacks. We've had rabid coyotes. Um, very few. There's only been perhaps three or four. One of the first ones, a jogger was attacked. The next day in the same community, an uh, outdoor yard worker was attacked. I think the next person was able to bludgeon it to death with a, with a, with a yard tool. Thing was trying to attack them. The jogger got bit up pretty good. Um, you know, we've had we've had food condition coyotes at a McDonald's highway rest stop walk up behind somebody, bite them in the leg. Um, so food conditioning is real. Coyotes that get food conditioned um, become an increased risk, an increased threat. Um, they lose that that instinctual little barrier, like, well, it's a person. I'm not. I'm not all that sure I want to get near that thing. Um, but when you start adding food, there's been case after case documented across the country where coyotes have attacked people you know, with backpacks or ripping things out of their hands. We've had one unconfirmed case in Connecticut. Person jumped on, treated at Yale New Haven. Some, they ripped a bag of food out of their hands in a parking lot. Um, but the person walking in and out of McDonald's never saw it, came up behind her, bit her in the leg. Um, not serious, but still. Um, food conditioning can become a real issue. And attacks on children. Um, coyotes can show predatory behavior towards children. It's been documented again and again. Coyotes will sometimes key in on a small child and target that child as prey. We've never had it happen in Connecticut. We've had children chased. You know, I'm running down this, you know, the coyote's right behind me. I turn around and swing my skateboard at it. Or we've had bike riders chased. We've had joggers, again, chased in the woods where a coyote bolts out of the woods. And again, a lot of the aggressive coyote behavior involving people are coyotes at den sites with puppies. Whether you're mowing your lawn and a coyote comes out and, like, stands you down, it's like, whoa, what's this coyote approaching me for? It's got puppies nearby showing its parental protective behavior. Um, so there have been some very uncomfortable, threatening behaviors. Dog walkers, we'll talk a little bit about, more about dog walkers entering wooded areas where there's coyotes denning and being chased out of the woods. You know, coyote came after me. Don't tell me it didn't come after me. It came after me. I ran for my life. Um, people have had some really gnarly experiences with coyotes. And I don't mean to say this, but you know, this, all this is going to continue to some degree. It's going to continue, in my opinion. I'm pretty pessimistic, kind of critical. But um, more, more and more and more, we're seeing coyotes living in more and more populated areas. We get coyotes living in downtown at the Pfizer's industrial complex. We had coyotes the other day living in downtown West Hartford at the DPW building and being fed, you know, surrounded by development. The only way in and out of there is following Park River. There's a strip of habitat, you know, where coyotes can sort of stay away from people. And they're being fed by the landscaping company there. And they got eight coyotes that's following and threatening the animal control officer. And they called me the other day and, you know, they're, they're considering taking aggressive action. If this coyote attacks somebody on their town property, um, they're, they're in trouble. Uh, but they have what is supposedly fed coyotes that have been fed there, supposedly den there too. Not sure where, they're, where the den was. Nobody reported it to us. But um, you know, when you get coyotes denning, this was taken by Animal Control Monroe, backyard downtown Monroe, Connecticut. Maybe it abuts the woods. You know, coyote denning under a, a backyard shed like foxes do. That's a coyote puppy in its mouth. They, they were able to harass the coyote out of there, screen it off, and um, the coyote took its puppies elsewhere. So they were able to solve that problem non-lethally, but more and more and more coyotes are showing up in developed areas, um, which can be a serious problem. 
can create a serious combination of factors where pets and people are going to get hurt. Disease coyotes are common. Mange is really common. We, we know that distemper's out there, heartworm. There's another disease out there. I can't pronounce it. Canococcus, it's, it's a fecal, fecal, you know, transmitted disease. Um, you know, obviously rabies is out there, but not really a big problem in coyotes. They can get it. Mange commonly affects puppies. Um, litters, for whatever reason, their, their immune system is not strong. Puppies seem to suffer from mange a lot. We'll get a litter of puppies that are dying from mange and becomes a, a local neighborhood concern. So I know I'm missing a ton of stuff and, and it's gonna get a little disorganized here, but you know we, we do wanna know about your coyote complaint. We have a database we maintain. We try to collect information on coyote complaints. We, we try to know in a community where the coyote complaints are coming from. That way, if we get a complaint to control coyotes, we can collect information. Yeah, we had 10 complaints there. We've had five dog attacks. We have, you know, one dog walker who says their dog was attacked on a leash. Um, you know, it's, it's, ra it's rising to that level of severity. Um, we we want to know the number of coyotes. We want to know, you know, the nature of the uh, confrontation or the conflict. We don't, we don't want to know that you saw a coyote at the, the edge of the, um, the town open space hunting mice. We don't want to know that. We want to know if you have a coyote conflict. It's in your yard three days in a row. It came up on your back deck, and it, it stalked your dog when you brought it in the house the other night. So we want to know, you know, real issues. Um, time of day, how many coyotes were involved, whether there's any feeding activity going on, um, what size is your pet, how, again, so we, we certainly want to know about um, the damage and the conflict. I guess we can ask questions as we go along here, but, you know, so here's some of the data that we've collected. And again, the data is only as good as we are in collecting it. And I can tell you, there's, there's gaps, there's, there's changes in personnel. We have a new database. We, here I go again, something happened. You know, we changed the database in 2013, and we're not collecting. Our phone systems changed. I used to be on the phones eight hours a day, and then when the day ended, I would hang the phone up and say, well, now I can get some work done. It was very, you know, coyote, coyotes are one of the most commonly complained about animals in Connecticut. And again, I know I'm, I'm very critical of the coyote problem. It is a serious problem. You can see by these numbers that we were getting you know, beginning in 2000, all the way through like 2010, we had 300 coyote complaints in Connecticut, small little Connecticut, we had th over 300 complaints. The numbers started to, to decline. And um, yes, I think some people are getting it. Um, they are taking precautions. Maybe a lot of those open suburban communities where coyotes filtered in and established territories. Um, people are now learning to coexist better with coyotes. They're learning to protect their, their dogs and coexisting with coyotes. So um, I think people have learned over the years, thanks to a lot of efforts by a lot of great animal control officers. Mark does a tremendous amount for a deep, whether it's bears or or other injured wildlife. So Mark has um, played a, a role as well as many others. Um, if you break down the 2018 complaints into a pie chart, what kind of complaint it is, what's, what's the, the, the primary reason why people are calling? Why does it keep doing that? Um, Yes, most of them are, yeah, there's a coyote that's in my street. I see him crossing my yard. You can call them sightings, but they're close proximity sightings. You know, there's coyotes that are coming into my yard and, and uh, or traveling in my community and I'm seeing them um, very close. So six, over 60% 60 of the calls are just sightings. We have 
The next greatest category would be primarily, I would say, you know, close encounters with people. When I say people, it's close encounters with people and their pets. The reason why coyotes are coming in close proximity with people is because you're attached to your pet. And I'm in my yard with my dog, or I'm going out in the yard with my dogs, and a coyote shows up. Or the coyote sits at the side of the yard. Or a coyote, I hear a coyote, you know, approaching in the wood line. I, I know he's there. He barks or, you know, I hear him and I go in the house. So, you know, we were seeing 10, 15 percent, you know, 30, 37 calls in 2018 were related to people feeling uncomfortable. The coyote was threatening to them, approaching me and my dog. Um, those numbers have gone up approximately 15 to 20 percent. You know, dog attacks or, th or attempted attacks on dogs, approximately 14 calls in 2018. That's, that's not as many as I said, 30 calls. We're down to 14. Um, um, well, that's actually dog attacks. So as far as threatening dogs, attempting, chasing dogs, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure why my numbers are a little <coughs> strange there, but you can see cat attacks are way down four. Um, poultry and livestock attacks are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty low. You know, they will kill sheep, um, lambs, calves, possibly foals. They will kill smaller livestock, goats. You know, farmyard geese, of course, chickens. So that's kind of a breakdown what we're seeing. And it does change slightly from year to year. I'll get you up here, Mark, in a second. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I use I use this situation in Fairfield as a classic coyote problem, and the reason why I say it's a classic problem is I don't I don't know the community that well. I know Fairfield County has a lot of beautiful habitat. It's very rugged, you know, a lot of one or two acre homes, um, a lot of woodlands around their homes. Um, Different parts of Fairfield County, you know, very beautiful, perfect habitat for a lot of wildlife, especially coyotes. Um, where do we get most of our coyote, coyote complaints? Southwestern Connecticut, Fairfield County, the coastal communities. We get a lot of coyote complaints along our coastal communities. Obviously, where we have people, um, pretty, pretty much coyotes are a density-related problem. Where you have people especially properties with a lot of property abutting natural areas, those are the areas where you're gonna have a coyote problem. Um, if you live next to a power line, you have a good chance of having a coyote problem. It, so many calls I get, okay, where do you live? And I look it up and there's, there's a, a right of way, gas line, power line. Coyotes are running those every night. They're traveling them. You live near a golf course? Good chance you could have a coyote problem if you live on a golf course. Coyotes love golf courses. Um, you live, you live uh, along a highway median, you know, the Merritt Parkway in, in New Canaan. Um, coyotes are constantly traveling the highway edges, scavenging, traveling to and from. Um, you live next to a town open space. Uh, your property abuts a, possibly a town park. Um, that's a property owner, if you own a dog, where you're probably gonna have a much greater chance of having a coyote problem. So in, in Fairfield, you can see up in northern part of Fairfield, there's highly populated Bridgeport. There's some of the reservoirs. It's you know, much more sparsely developed up in Easton, but the coyote population say, well, we need more space. And so coyotes came to the country club, Brooklawn, and uh, Oh, first year they started a, a den and they raised a litter of pups and the golf course tolerated them. They killed their turkeys. The deer population diminished. That was a plus. Um, you know, coyotes somewhat coexisted with the people and the golfers. Nobody had a real serious problem with them. Um, the next year, the coyotes started to, to hunt the neighborhood. And dog after dog after dog was being attacked and killed. So there must have been six or seven dogs within 
that year attacked and killed in constant conflicts with coyotes in that community. And uh, so, you know, again, that's what I believe is the, one of the key, you know, classic case histories of where you're going to have a severe coyote problem was when they move into kind of an island habitat, whether it's a town park and it's relatively heavily developed and you get a, a denning pair of coyotes that establish a dominant presence there, they learn where they're going to find food. And, and once perhaps some of the natural prey abundance is is uh, not as abundant perhaps as it was, or, or they just learn to be bolder and bolder, because so those coyotes are gonna disperse into the community. That's where we're gonna get the greatest number of dog attacks. Same thing happened in the town of Old Saybrook, um, where coyotes established themselves around North Cove, and the problems escalated with multiple, multiple, multiple dog attacks. So I'm um, beating that to death. I didn't know where to put this slide, but um, I'm going to skip it for now. Um, Simsbury, you know, maybe Mark can um, say a few things about his town. This is a crazy little slide. I don't have a good mapping skills, but the, the circled areas are not coyote territories. Those are, those are the, the, the densely populated areas of the town. And um, in my opinion, you know, these are the areas, there's golf courses intermixed in here, a couple of golf courses. Uh, no, no real coyote complaints from the golf course. There's uh, Ethel Walker School, I believe, right right north of Orchard Road. And, right, uh, yeah. Is that we, road far? Well, you have Park, you have Orchard, you have Overlook. We've had complaints from dog walkers at Ethel Walker being chased out of the, the horse trails there. <clears throat> Don't know if Ethel Walker has had any field complaints. This is the, uh, the community on Orchard and right. um, where we had um, a case reported of feeding, uh, feeding of right. coyotes. We've had, we've had a case in 2012 with multiple dog attacks on Pinnacle Mountain area. Right. Yeah. So I just, I don't know if this means a lot, it shows, I, I can say this, compared to the town of New Canaan or, or perhaps the town, town of Old Saybrook, compared to the town of Avon, you know, there's hardly any dogs on the map. We're not getting a lot of complaints from Kingsport. We're not getting a lot of complaints from Canton. Um, we're, we're, getting a ton, we're getting a ton of complaints from Avon. A ton of complaints from Avon. If I made a map of Avon, There'd be dots everywhere. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. And <clears throat> this one right here is uh, by the Ethel Walker School. This neighborhood here, we had a, a woman who had a, uh, well, one of the residents, her dog was uh, severely attacked. And what, what Chris said is true. There's a, there's a right of way, there's a, there's a somewhat semi open space there. But the problem we had here was there was a one resident leaving food out. Uh, I don't mean bird feeders and suet. I mean leaving large parcels of food and, you know, meat products and so forth. So we, we addressed that. Hopefully that stopped. The other slide you saw before, a couple stop. slides before. What's that? Yeah, it's not. All right, well, we can follow up with you on that. The other one, uh, Potter Forest, there was a picture of a coyote. That's when they were developing the Potter Forest. A couple of those dogs, uh, those coyotes, were so human habituated in food conditions that they caused us, <coughs> us uh, with, the, with the state game wards that were in conflicts with our removal. What was happening is the uh, the food trucks are coming out every day. The workers are, were throwing food before you know it. We got them on camera where these coyotes would almost walk up to these these workers like dogs feeding them. So and keep that in mind. A fed animal, wildlife's dead wildlife too. <coughs> Um, yeah, we've had several attacks, unfortunately. Now, maybe in other towns, it's, you know, obviously, uh, you know, in, in the chart, not many, but I understand, like, if you beloved a pet, family companion. I have three dogs myself. I was a Marine Corps canine handler, Hartford Police. 
I like my dogs better than most of the humans I know. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, let me throw in one or two of my relatives on that. <laughs> um, oh, the other thing he said that, that coyotes like golf, so they, uh, they love golf, so that's why they buy golf courses. It's like me as a cop being like one to live next to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, we are addressing it. Unlike the bears, now I've been to probably many of your yards, when there's a bear in a garbage can, trash receptacle, or a pool, or a bug, what I will do is engage in aversive conditioning, ma conditioning management, meaning whether it's a discharge noise round or, or a beanbag round from a, a shotgun, which is less lethal. Coyotes, 99% of the calls I go to, by the time we arrive, myself or another officer, the coyote is gone, keeping in mind it's an opportunistic predator. Uh, you know, like Chris said, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, the dogs, they, they're in the backyard or they're within, you know, fairly close proximity of an owner. Those coyotes lie in wait and they wait for that unsuspecting dog to get by that tree line or wood line or a little distance away and hit pounce. And unfortunately, we've had several dogs. We said Pinnacle Mountain. We were up there a few years ago and it was, you know, they were just going after dog after dog. Uh, I can mention many, many other type, many other cases here. But the most recent right now is where we're still addressing it and as you've been concerned, you know, which I guess is still going on, so we'll get back addressing that issue. Well, yes, go ahead. Can I, can I address something just real quick? Um, We do miss calls. We yeah, miss calls. I've heard you're like walking in late from football. Um, but I think you've got maybe a problem with your phone system because I know I've called, I know my neighbors have called, and, it, and we haven't gotten a ton of calls. Um, and then I was in research, and I'm really used to interacting with the good wildlife. I have heard the coyotes for years before this incident occurred. Um, and I heard the coyotes outside my office in a, in a commercial area of Avon just the other night. There were several coyotes there. I thought that's because they're calling my call. But just because the Sioux Prairie residents aren't calling me, Oh, I agree. You know, the phones are challenging. We're, we're, uh, we have many, many different field offices, and the phone system is a little complicated, and I admit I'm not a high-tech guy, but you dial 3011, the Wildlife Division main number, 424-3011, it could go to Sessions Woods in Burlington. Call could go to Franklin W. Wildlife Management Area in Franklin. Call could come to Hartford. Um, so there's, there's a phone tree, and it could get diverted to anybody. And if it gets picked up, they may transfer you to me. It may get into my voicemail. And this has been a tough year, I admit. There's phone calls that didn't get returned. I don't remember your name on any call I didn't return. But I, I, I could plead guilty. You know, it's challenging. It's very challenging. You know, if you had a severe coyote problem, like, oh, my neighbor's feeding coyotes, I would hope you would report it to your local PD. And I would hope they would call us and say, hey, we've got a real problem individual here, irresponsible person. These coyotes are there every day. So, so we... I'm open for suggestions. You know, I have a direct direct number, and you're <laughs> welcome to, to take it. Um, you know, there's. The question in a different realm. Go ahead. You said something about establishing territory. I haven't heard the singing of coyotes in 30 years in my in my neighborhood. In the last couple of years, I am hearing it again. You talked about. government, 
Well, I don't, I don't mean to be rude or, or cruel today, but there is no government coyote control program from the state. And there never has been. There's no government trappers. There's no, there's no response. I'm not going out to deal with coyotes at Orchard Road. Um, and people I know, it's a wildlife problem, call the wildlife division. So the, the average phone call goes like this. What happened? Well, my dog was attacked. And okay, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me a little bit more and we'll, we'll document the call and I'll provide you information. Well, this is what happened. I'm like, well, you know, the state has a policy where we can control coyotes when they cause severe damage. So supervised pets, we're gonna get there. Supervised pets attack or threaten to attack human beings. Now, if your pet was let out unsupervised at night, we generally would not consider that an unusual or threatening behavior on behalf of the coyote. Um, I know there's a lot of room for interpretation. I work with a lot of people. I just wanna say that a lot of people think they're gonna call us and we're gonna solve your coyote problem. I'm gonna help, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna help you. Oh, I do it all the time. Oh, I do it all the time. Well, you're not Chris, answering this if I can. question. Yeah, we, we if, have, I, if I may. We have, we have plenty, of, plenty of people that we've responded to. We've done plenty of coyote control efforts um, that have been very successful. If I may. I, I just want to say, uh, uh, a lot of people don't know that they should be calling uh, DEP if they had an interaction with DEP. Uh, I didn't know that that was standard procedure, so I didn't call you because I figured what could you do for me at that time. Uh, I'd like you to go over what some of the uh, laws are uh, as far as hunting and trapping, uh, maybe some of the mating times, talk about the, the animal in general, is it not, are they nocturnal? And then we can talk about uh, what point does DEEP get involved in with the local animal control officer? What can they do on private property versus you can't do? And do we, uh, are there things that will help the residents of Simsbury um, address this issue? Because it, it's mother nature, so it's always ongoing, but how do we have somewhat control over it so people feel safe letting the animals out in their own yards. And their children, we, we just saw slides up today that they may go after the little children as well. So could you just oh. address those things? And then, we can, then we'll take some questions from the audience. So let them just hit those topics. Not, not sure. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's try to answer some, some of these questions from the senator. Um, how do I get back to the main? said when I go coyotes are different by the time we get there as a police department you know they're in one gone most of the time I think I've, I've had one or two and that was the color forest where I'm getting the two pigeons because they were so human habituated to poop and you when I opened my my truck door he thought I was going to come on and give him half of my sandwich you know unlike that the food truck that's it you know as opposed to the bears which everybody here has seen multiple bears I go in there all the time they look at me like yeah baldy I'll, I'm going to I'll finish, when I'm done with this garbage, I'll move. You know, I have to now hit them with beanbag rounds, or noise rounds, all that ways, and we're not trying to harm them, but we are trying to keep them on it. Coyotes, I find out, are a little different. Now, I'm, you know, I'm a layman in terms of, like, a biology with them, like, the, like Chris is, but we will work hard, you know, to, to make sure that you, you know, that, you know, your property's safe, you're safe, your children, of course, are domestic pets. And we will do what we can. 
with their limited reason. There's other issues too. Uh, powder forest, people, they don't, they don't dream of that. The folks over in this overlook uh, park road, we've got a resident leaving, you know, 40 bag, 40 pound bags of bird seed and maybe two or three half eaten rotisserie chickens out there. And, you know, a tray of pork chops. And you, you, you talk to them and they go, oh, we're feeding the deer and the birds. Well, we know better. No, we try to address that. We're working, that's why we're right here with Senator Winkos, and we have many elected officials here. We are looking at uh, several possible management, you know, uh, uh, you know, ways to, to maybe combat this. Uh, whether, you know, and I don't want to use the word ordinances and, 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 and different laws, but, you know, we're looking at that because for me, I, I don't have a lot of, you know, um, when it comes to somebody feeding, you know, I've, I've dealt with these residents, residents in the past, they weren't a person, no, they're not people. Um, but <clears throat> unfortunately, there's not a lot that we really, I can do as far as enforcement. Fortunately, I've got a good, you know, at least to some degree, at least, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we, uh, I'm able to get people to somewhat be cooperative. But that's why we're here tonight. We're trying to have a cooperative effort here. But I'll have to come up with some strategy and things. And, and listen, I, I, I understand that people are concerned. I live in Wethersfield, and I, my, my, my town is nowhere near as populated with our density of women as well. And I hear them hooking and hollering. I grew up in Bethlehem. I'm yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not from Simsbury. Well, I'm not well, either. I forced to say hard to believe. So. But anyway, <laughs> I've been listening to you know, coyotes for 40 plus years. Sure. So no there, reports of there, abuse, there's, so you don't there's, think we have a big problem. I, I, I live right it's between Lebanon and school, and I have called several times, and they told me there was going to be like a camera kind of motion study. I never saw the camera and the motion study. I never saw any activity, and we are having large predators in my yard, if not weekly, every other week, and I feel I am playing Russian roulette with my dog. 90% of the time, they're not there. Yeah, I'm, wa I'm wondering what, what what do we need to do to have it coyote proof? Well, so, I mean, I find we don't anything like that normally is done to keep a, a coyote or a bear out. I mean, one one thing that sometimes works is fencing. That's not an absolute either. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's you know, there's we I've 
fenced in my yard. I don't have coyotes like you, but I got three dogs. I mean, one thing. But, you know, and we have them in my area, so I, I put a fence in. But these electronic containment systems and like horse wiring and everything like that, but uh, that, that's not going to work at all. Well, we've got anchor, anchor fencing, but it's not. Yeah. But yeah. we didn't do it to, to keep uh, right. wildlife out. No, you can keep your dogs in. We, we like wildlife. Any fence, if you're a dog owner, any fence is better than no fence. Right. Yeah. A four and a half foot chain in, link is, in my opinion, going to stop most coyotes from intruding into your yard. Right. In most cases, you let your dog out at 12 o'clock at night and it's a little Dijon, and that coyote's like, whoa, boom, bumps right over, You're grabs the dog, the bounces leash. back out. So obviously, you have to put it in perspective, but um, a, a fence is a barrier. A coyote to, to, to come over that barrier is going to have to be highly motivated to come in and eat that dog. You know, is he gonna come in and, and chase a big black lab around a fence yard? Maybe, but probably, you always have, probably you always not. Have your dog um, so if you, you want a permanent a barrier, you're gonna have to think six foot high, you know, stockade, a, a livestock type fence or a modified fence that's six feet high is a coyote proof fence. We invite wildlife. You ask, what is a coyote-proof yeah, fence? Six foot, back. six yeah. foot fence. Dog and reports from other people. Can you isolate on a map the hot spots that have been spotted by them? I know you track bears, and you know that they move. Who, so on your map, I saw your map. <coughs> oh, it's not Anderson Fairfield. It's inner city of St. Louis. So what areas have they been actually identified? Well, that's what we, we've done. If you, you know, like we just mentioned, like Pinnacle Mountains had quite a bit of coyote, you know, activity. Is that the only area? What's that? That's not the only area. No, but you saw that we had, there was Pia Lane, there was Farms, Farms Village Road. Lincoln <coughs> Road. But, but, if, but if you identify our, our, our well, deer. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, now I'm giving you the information. Okay, good. Right now, if you want to use the word hotspot, it's Bedeva Walker, Latimer Lane, Overlook Park, that whole region. That seems to be very populated with coyotes. We're getting the most calls and a lot of activity. We've had dogs attack people, stalk. So that, you know, it, that would be a hot spot, if you will. Uh, but I get calls all over town. You go right here and then you're in I want to go back to how do we get help. On the Overlook Terrace, not just the cedar, but there's a wood pile that we believe is right on that gas line mm -hmm. area. And they seem to be denny deer because consistently when I'm out with my dog, day or night, I hear them come back there. The neighbors have seen them coming up from there. We've got them on video coming up from there. December 26th of last year, you came out and you walked the property and you saw paw prints coming out of the wood pile. And you told me that you'd be getting in touch with DPP to help take apart the wood pile to help move them on. But that hasn't happened. And the coyote problem is getting worse. Amy was attacked. We now have small children living in that house. How do we get this taken apart and get them to move on? And, and you told me you were going to install cameras and see what was going on back there. Right, and, right. With that, for that lady. Well, that wasn't for that. Was for that for that lady. But so we did, you know, which I didn't get anything on film, but I did put a camera back there. So just because I didn't call you and tell you it's back there, no, I did I put a call. Video, uh, I did. I know you anyway, did. So what did you find? I returned your call. Uh, what did you but find? No, I. Definitely, I put the, the lady was out there dropping. Well, what I saw was bird feed. I didn't see anything. But I have no doubt this woman was feeding, was is or was feeding coyotes, or, or leaving food out for all various species, not just coyotes. I bet there was bears coming up to that yard. And so it's just not the so, so let me just ask a question in general. So if, if we know that people are feeding, potentially feeding wildlife, is there a local ordinance or law that prevents them from doing that? That you. No, as awareness. far as I, uh, as far as I know, no. But no, that's something that the town has looked at. Maybe as you know, I know it's been it's been mentioned. However, to be honest with you, I mean, an ordinance. 
I don't know if that's the best idea. That's in my opinion. First of all, we you know we don't want to. You know, people don't want to be right tell regulated what they can and can't have in their yard. So I mean, if that ever did come to any fruition, it wouldn't limit bird feeders and sewage and so forth. But for the folks maybe leaving big parcels of, of uh, food and you know, but um, and I know that has been discussed. You don't want to but I don't know if that's the answer either because. No, face it, every time that somebody drops a, a bag of bird seed in her yard or it's food, you know, it's gonna cause a police response. I mean, it can, it can turn into a, a nightmare, so. You, you don't, don't want to attack them uh, when the bears are out cruising around in the, in the summer, so you have your feeder, maybe just turn the- Well, we've had information about the leafy versus not the leaf or feed. Um, yes, sir, that's good. Oh, oh, oh you mind, sorry, just tell you. So SC, SCTV is here today taping uh, this, so folks that couldn't make it tonight can watch it at home. So they've asked that we repeat the question so it's on audio and then ask the, our two yeah, presenters to answer the question from here. So sure. the, the question was, how, how can, what are the laws as far as gun rights go? How can we protect ourselves if that um, Yeah, I can address happens. that. Sure. So, you are. Oh. I have a slide on it if you want me to pull it up. All right. Well, I... I well, you know, you, yeah, an air gun, paintball gun, things like that to move those to, to haze the animal. No, if you're talking a weapon, first of all, if it's to protect your, your, your yourself, another human being, your livestock, you have a right to do that. Um, however, keep in mind, we also have, there's ordinances with firearms. I don't recommend, you know, discharging a firearm in, a, in any time. So I, that would be... You know, we have other control measures. Some people may agree, some people may not like it, but you also, we have, we have, uh, we have professional trappers. I mean, with, with this sanctioned by the state, if there's a problem, I mean, they have to get a permit. It's a permitted event. And then you have, connect, you have professional trappers who come out here, because we don't recommend anybody taking this into their own hands. You have pros out here who know what they're doing, have the proper equipment, training, and tools to eradicate some of these problems. We do recognize and realize there are certain areas where we're having a little more problems with these coyotes than others. So, um, this is a gentleman in the back had his hand up yeah, for a while. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, talking about invasive species, so we're talking about potentially trapping them. What are we doing after we trap them? Don't tell me the location. It's not the answer. That doubles up the problem somewhere else. Since they're territorial, we have a gentleman from the Yeah, what are the trapping laws? Do we allow relocation of coyotes? What are you doing when you seize an animal, capture an animal? The, D, the, D, the DEP does not come out to your private property to trap coyotes, sir. Again, there are regulated, there are regulated trapping seasons, and there is a special permit process. If you have a severe coyote problem, if you're a farmer losing calves, we'll issue you a permit to hire a professional trapper, and that permit will allow out-of-season trapping. The trapping season is November 3rd through March 15th. Coyotes are managed as a game animal and as a fur bear. So we manage coyotes just like every other state in the country. And as, as a DEP, we issue permits when they cause severe damage. So if you have severe threatening behavior where a dog is attacked on a leash, we will, in many cases, issue you a permit. The permit will go to a... Again, sir, let me finish. We will issue a permit to control coyotes. And if you have livestock being attacked, we will issue a permit to authorize the control of coyotes. How many issued in the last year? You have a right to protect your property. You don't need a permit to shoot a coyote on your property. As long as you're not violating, no, it, violating safety laws, you're not right. shooting the neighbor's right. house. If you're in the middle of a, an attack, trapping is not. Well, you're right. If you're in the middle of an attack, you're going to first of all defend yourself. Fight for you. You're going to fight. There's yeah, been three people attacked in Connecticut 
that have been bitten in Connecticut. So the chances of being attacked by a coyote, I, I didn't mean to over-exaggerate the risk, are extremely rare. Dog walkers have been aggressively approached on multiple occasions every year. There's been a few dogs attacked on leashes, um, perhaps a, a handful every few years. So, you know, when you're saying, oh, I'm gonna lock and load and carry my Glock um, every time I go for a walk around the neighborhood, not, not, not no, really not realistic. Necessary. So actually we're very lucky this evening that, um, uh, and he's agreed to come up out of the audience and address some of your concerns. Scott Neal is here, and he's the president and the director of the Connecticut Hunters and Trapping Association. So uh, while well, some of the things we talked about, you know, the last minute to, to defend yourself and your animals and your children, uh, you may want to do something preventative and maybe having a trapper come out and set some traps up on your property to deal with this. And I think Scott's the, the perfect person to talk about what they do when they get a phone call or what they do. And Scott, if you just can answer the question from back here because it's all taped for the TV, okay. I appreciate it. Good evening. Um, I'm the, one of the directors for the Connecticut Trappers Association. I'm also a licensed new cone in the state of Connecticut. Um, it, is, it is an issue, but unfortunately, a lot of the private landowners, if there's not a large enough piece of property, uh, we can't trap it during a regular fur season, uh, which is December 1st through January 31st. We're required to have 10 contiguous acres of property. One of my suggestions is, if you've got a golf course that's closed during the season, um, a larger landowner in your neighborhood, there are, the Connecticut Trappers Association ha will do it at no cost if we have a trapper in your area that's licensed to do it. If it meets the requirements on a larger parcel of property, you may be able to talk to your neighbor that's got 50 acres and say, look, we're having a problem over here. Can we bring somebody in on your property? It meets the requirements for uh, removal. I trapped several large parcels of property. I'm from the eastern part of the state, about an hour east of here, over almost the town of Union. Um, I trapped several large parcels during the winter. Um, coyote problems have diminished on most of them. Um, we don't get in the neighborhoods, we don't get the, the, the complaints that you're getting here because we're removing off of a 300 acre parcel anywhere between five to 14 coyotes a year on multiple parcels. Um, I also, you know, some of it is, um, you know, complaint work, people call, um, but there, it's highly regulated. And, you know, everybody talks, you know, you hear trap and you think, oh, my God, you're going to have this thing with teeth and it's going to, you know, it's going to. I brought a, a Connecticut legal coyote trap here tonight to show you to, to, to dispel this myth. This is it. It's a rubber padded jaw trap that we're required to use. And it's required because we have to release any non-target animal. If we caught a fox, if we caught a raccoon, if we caught a possum. And the reason is because it doesn't damage them. It doesn't hurt them. You can open it up and you can let them go. The same with, you know, that's why part of my reason for being here tonight is the Connecticut Trappers tries to prevent any, and please don't take this wrong, but any rogue trapping. We get people to say, oh, I'm going to fix it. They go online, they buy a few traps. First off, they're probably not going to catch a coyote. A coyote is not a simple animal to catch. Um, they're very smart. Um, but you may catch your neighbor's dog, and the trap may not be anchored properly, and the dog is going to run across your yard, and he's going to run down the road, and there's going to be all over the paper that some illegal trapper put this out there. We're highly regulated by the deep in the state of Connecticut, and it requires a, a special license to trap them. Um, I'll be out in the, in the lobby after if anybody has any questions, but there's, there's things that can be done. New, you know, new coats can be hired also um, in non... Well, it stands for Nuisance Wildlife Control Operator. Yes. If it's a state license. I actually have that state license myself, also a trapping license, but uh, it, it's, it's they're for hire. This is it. This is what we have, okay? See? didn't break my fingers and that's no different than what it does it, it, it's a restraining device so when you you know I don't be alarmed that when somebody mentions what well, we could trap them it's a restraining device until they can be dispatched properly um, in, in a safe effective manner uh, 
regulated by the American Veterinary Association. Scott, to clarify, they're not relocated. They're, they're they cannot be relocated, and I'm sure down. you know Chris will touch on that. We cannot relocate them. They are they're you know dispatched and removed. No. And they grow together as no. A group and no. And I'm not. I'll be honest with you. I'm not even. Uh, if it was up to me, ten acres is not a, to me isn't really enough property because unless you're centrally located in it, you've got a large number of people you know nearby. And I'm not. Like I said, you know, we're not gonna. You're not gonna hurt somebody's dog if you catch it. But it becomes a nuisance thing. Um, you're much better off if you can get a larger parcel. Um, railroad tracks are, are, are other runways for them. If you've got an abutter that abuts a railroad track or a trail that's got 20 acres, even if it is 10, if it's in a rural area, it, you know, but it has to be contiguous. You can't have five acres on one side of the road and five on the other. I've had that a lot. People say, well, I own over here and over there. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Yes. What does it have to do with the seasonal special permits are entirely separate. So, uh, and so they can be available for uh, 12 months of the year, 52 weeks of the year. Basically. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I have a slide if I can get back to it. So you just have No, no, no. If you're if you're seeing you know a large number of foxes, you're probably not going to see uh, a large number of coyotes. Um, if you're seeing coyotes, the foxes have either been removed coyotes by the coyotes or they've coyotes run off. The yeah, or or you know, you know, be predators towards them. Could you guys answer what's the typical uh, telltale sign of a den that if you're walking or you look you think you may have one on your property what would signify a den so you may be aware that there may be a, uh, a den of coyotes there and what is the average size of a, of a litter that a coyote may have and how often do they have those so you get a better idea of how often the uh, coyote population punishes itself I don't have any photos of dens but dens can be quite variable you know you could have a typical basketball sized burrow in the ground um, a coyote can dig its own, can take over a fox den, a woodchuck burrow. Usually it's on a sloping, you know, well-drained hillside. You can get coyote dens and rocky outcrops. I've, I've found multiple coyote dens out traipsing in the woods doing what I do and, um, you know, coming upon them. So, you know, you get lucky and you can find dens. They can den under a shed. Like I showed you the example of the, you know, a typical litter is five to seven coyote pups. They're highly prolific breeders. You know, their survival rate is is pretty high. So, you know, you know, perhaps at the end of the summer, three to four coyote pups are alive after a birth of perhaps seven, seven pups. Others perish, starvation, disease, depredation from other coyotes or roadkill. So, you know, coyote populations have the ability to, to um, ex, you know, to increase um, pretty quickly, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, large-scale coyote eradication programs have been shown to be very, you know, ineffective. Um, yet, you know, a scorched-earth policy of poisoning every coyote that happened in the in the 1800s certainly suppressed the the continental coyote population from the Canadian prairies down to you know, down to Texas um, with millions and millions of poison baits they put out to, to control coyotes and kill, you know, wolves. But what they show is in large, large scale research projects, um, you can suppress coyote populations. Um, intensive trapping can suppress, and yes, hunting and regulated hunting and regulated trapping, the intent is to perhaps remove um, 
surplus animals from the population, you're removing animals that may not survive the winter anyway, you may be able to suppress the core population to a level, but you're not eradicating coyotes by trapping them out of an area. Is there you know? any research on so, there's, there's no there's no programs that are being done that I'm aware of in, in, in the Northeast. Um, so What's as far as food? so as far as Rodents? you know coyotes repopulating an area annually, you may you may conduct coyote control, and you may have coyote free neighborhood for three or four or five years. You may coy get coyotes that that move back into that town town property or the golf course. Um, Brooklawn Country Club hasn't had a problem since 2009. Um, it's been 10 years in there. Is there a natural predator for coyotes? Other coyotes. You know, coyotes will attack each other. The Chevrolet is, you know, the, the biggest killer of coyotes is roadkill. Is what? Roadkill. Mm -hmm. Cars. That's, that's the number one killer of coyotes in Connecticut. Connecticut harvests about 300 coyotes a year. About 200 are trapped, another 150 are shot, 300, 350 coyotes annually. That's it. Um, out of a population that may be, you know, 10,000 animals, um, the harvest is very low. Coyotes are not, not easily trapped. They're not highly regarded as fur bearers. They're not, uh, fur, fur trappers are motivated by the love of trapping, the love of the outdoor experience and the challenge of trapping. They love, they love to be in the forests, and they're, whether they're trapping a fisher, a gray fox, you know, a coyote, um, beaver trapping, but they're, they're not, they're not going to eliminate coyotes. The number of trappers in Connecticut is so low um, that coyote trapping is not going to eliminate coyotes. They're certainly um, helping landowners that have, you know, agricultural issues where Hey, I raise I raise livestock. I don't want coyotes anywhere near my farmland. I, I'm I'm trapping coyotes every year, and that is helpful. And yes, it suppresses the coyote population. Chris, could you circle back to one of the first questions as to can you report online through the DEP website, or if not, can not, you provide a phone number? Not currently. Uh, to the folks. Um, you know, our phone number four two four three zero one one. If you have a coyote complaint, you can ask for me, and they'll send you to Hartford. Hopefully, I can get to your call. Also, also, there are handouts at the back that uh, Chris brought with him uh, that has a lot of information. Is your phone number on that handout sheet? 424-3496. Um, okay, so that may answer a lot of questions. Um, if you don't have, yeah. if you're, uh, you're traveling yeah. to the are you more likely to encounter a coyote or are you more likely to encounter one or I'm sorry, I missed that. If you're walking in. Generally, when you see coyotes, you don't see packs. Generally, you see a lone coyote, you see a pair. Um, people have reported packs. Um, this is a time of year where packs are reported more commonly. I went outside and there's there's ten eyeballs, there's twelve eyeballs. You know, this they just got done chasing my dog, and I see twelve eyeballs in the forest. That's a pack of coyotes. That's a family group of coyotes. So an air horn, for example, take care of that. So you're carrying ten oh. It, it, it certainly is recommended. Okay. Um, loud noise, being highly aggressive, making yourself large and threatening. So, something I'd like to add also. Um, another resource you have to contact as well is the DEP, and not for an emergency situation. But if you go online to the Connecticut Trappers Association, we have emails for all the directors, for our officers. We can be we reach by email. Our phone numbers are there. If it's possible that you fit the criteria, you know, we may be able to help you out. Um, but as long as we can continue to trap in Connecticut, last year we almost lost that right. Um, and keep in mind, the only animal that we can trap, that we put a trap on dry ground for, on dry dirt, is a coyote. Everything else has to be underwater. Um, but that's another avenue. If you're seeing complaints and you've got 15 acres and they're constantly coming, we have this season that we, we may be able to assist you at no cost and say, look, we'll come out. Um, you know, the Connecticut Trappers Association, that, if, you, if you go on that, that, that's it, you know, CTA. And, and you're gonna get information we've got there, so our contact information is there. 
we're happy to, to try to get back to you. And, you know, we always get back to you. There, there's plenty of us. Uh, there's a director in each county in the state. How can you support your organization? <laughs> Melissa. Can I comment on the 10 acre thing? Yeah. Because we can trap, and I, and I probably wasn't clear on that. We can trap them on less than 10 acres, okay. but not on dry ground. It would either have to be in the burrow of the animal or in the den. We can, so if the trap can be placed in a den out of sight and not on dry ground in a trail, we can come to your house and trap. If you've got two acres of land, or if you said, yeah, there's a den in this pile and I own this property, you can sign a, a permit for us and we can put a trap in that den or under the edge of the water at the brook and bait them into it. You can go in the wetlands, you know. But, right. But, you know, if the trap is under the edge of water or in the den, we can trap any parcel with your permission, with the written permission of the landowner. Oh, so, so we have a, a camera back there, Mark put a camera back there to watch the den. Mm -hmm. So well, why can't we get some traps inside the den there? If there's a, if you could. But if there's a trapper in your area that, that is able to do it. You also have to realize it's, it's a large time commitment for someone. For me to come out, um, if I do it as a, as a, a nuisance wildlife, it, it re, I mean, regardless, it requires a 24-hour check every day, mandatory. I have to physically come out and look every 24 hours and check those traps, make sure that they're safe, make sure that there's no animal in it. Uh, if there's a non-target animal, I have to release it. Uh, does so, your website, Scott, tell if there's trappers that live in the Farmington Valley area? So people, you, you, you're saying you live out eastern. Or the, we have our, we have our directors are all listed. Okay. There's a director in each county, and but you can contact any of us. We can we can field the call, and and take care of it and, and put it to the appropriate director in that area. Or we know what trappers are in what counties, and not all of our trappers are also coyote trappers. It's 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 a difference. Um, We'll send something out about how we're going.
Thank you. Actually, we're, we're limited. I want to get as many questions as we can. I didn't think people were aware of, of calling it in. I know after having Melissa's dog, when I have to have my dog, I see it all over social media, people posting pictures of coyotes in the Kent, West Canton area, West Simsbury area. It's very, very prevalent. And if it takes all of us to start calling in every single time we see something to to have a state agency react and say, wow, look at all the coyotes here. What they can do, I don't know, but it would they make it um, more so, so you have some of the Connecticut uh, Trappers Association, they may want to come out or folks, uh, you know, we can talk about um, how to keep people safe and, and not feed the animals. I think that's, that is one of the biggest things is, please don't feed mothers nature's animals so they can take care of themselves. I want to get a couple more questions in the back and then some in the hands. The question is, if you're hearing coyotes, are, are they concentrated close by? Uh, how far away are they? You know, my basic answer would be, you know, if you're hearing them, they're there. Um, coyotes at the horse guard have been a, a regular um, complaint location in Avon. I, I think it's in Avon, right? Yes. So, you know, they've had problems with coyotes and they lost a pony there. They don't know if the pony was, you know, preyed upon during the night or died and, and uh, was scavenged after it died of natural forces factors. Um, but so, you know, if you live in that community, you should certainly talk it up with your neighbors. You should take precautions if you have dogs. Um, there's, there's a couple of roads in that community. I'm trying to think of the name of the road off the top of my head. Som Somerset? Som Somerset Drive. Um, you know, so the coyote issues in that area are certainly common. Avon has had a lot of complaints. Um, and, and again, I, I know there's been so many questions thrown from different directions, and, and I, I apologize. I don't think a lot was communicated effectively in some cases. But, you know, I know a gentleman says here, oh, I used to call, nobody can do anything. The police aren't going to, I don't mean to be blunt, but the police aren't going to come out because you see a coyote. Um, coyotes are, are here to stay. And if you see a coyote in your yard, if it, if it threatened your dog and said, you know, holy cow, the thing almost got my dog tonight. It chased us back into the house on the leash. You know, we certainly want to get that call. And we, we certainly can give you guys, yeah, you, you might want to think about a fence as a, as a property owner. If you have a dog and you're having coyote conflicts, a fence is, is unfortunately going to be one of your best preventative measures. Um, keeping your dog leashed and closely controlled is certainly... Um, you know, the number one control measure. But we, we issue permits to control severe coyote damage when they attack supervised pets. Uh, they attack pets within leash fence yards. They attack livestock within fenced areas. Um, we, we attack coyotes that, we control coyotes that um, threaten people, uh, chase or stalk a child. We certainly will respond, and we certainly have the ability. Um, it's it's up to the landowner to request a permit. There is an application. We mail out applications now. In the past, we didn't use one. Um, the landowner would contract with a professional trapper, like Scott. Scott is a, a licensed regular trapper. 
got those professional nuisance traps. So he will charge you for coyote control. The state doesn't come out and trap nuisance coyotes for you. Um, the town could hire a professional trapper to control coyotes in the town. They would need permission from the landowner. They would need permission from their select person if it was on town property. But again, it's, you know, the police aren't gonna come out and solve your coyote problem unless they've attacked, you know, a leash dog and you call an emergency. The coyote's still here. He just attacked my dog on a leash. Okay, so let me go. My assistant's in the back, Tim Waldron, so if you, if you want to be uh, contacted, give him your contact information. If you want to offer, if you have something you may want to offer, let him know. But there's some of the selectmen I work very close to. The selectmen, I'm available, just reach out to me, you know, um, and we can talk about it. You know, I have some ideas. Do I, do we have to look at, is the 10 acre, is that a, a regulation or is that a state statute? Do we just have to address that? Why is the traffic season designed with just that, those during those months? So, I mean, I'm going to do a little bit deeper dive, educate myself too on some of these things. And why doesn't, uh, as we're, I know Governor Lamont is investing a lot of money in uh, upping our, um, upgrading our technology systems in the state of Connecticut. I wanna make sure that we can do some reporting online through DEEP, because nowadays you can do everything through the IG, so we're gonna make sure that, uh, and I'll be talking to uh, Commissioner Dykes to say, you know, uh, we've gotta make it easier for residents. If uh, you can't get through on the phone, it's not documented, we gotta at least have a paper trail that you can say that I did report it, and you can put it on the property review report. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for coming this evening. Thank you to Chris and Mark and Dr. Thank you. I just want to say one quick thing. It's, it's, don't hesitate to call us here at Sims Area Police or call me if you have any you know, coyote questions or a site in or a problem. Because in fairness, I have to say, our state DEP we have a tremendous, we have a great rapport and working relationship here with our Sims Area with them. They've been nothing but stellar and very helpful to us. So, but as far as first reporting, I face it, in, in fairness to the state DEP, there's only a handful and they feel called state rights. So I understand there are times that they may, you know, they may appear that, you know, and face it, I've, I've been called myself, you know, once they're human, we feel called all the time, you know, it's what happens. But in fairness, they may be taken down to the Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Uh, Senator Kevin. 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 Kevin